questions today. All right, so I think with that, it's time we begin. So today, I am thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. I am your host, Zlatko Minev, from IBM Quantum Research. And today, I have the uh, delight and privilege of hosting Daniel Campbell, who will talk about work he did with the Engineering Quantum Systems Group at MIT on universal non-adiabatic control of small gap superconducting qubits. Hello, Dan. How are you today? I am great. Thank you. It's good to see you. Where are you tuning in from today, Dan? I'm tuning in from Rome, New York. Rome, New York. Love it. Uh, I'd love the chance to visit. Uh, before we pull up your slides, Dan, allow me to give a bit of a bio. <clears throat> Daniel Campbell received his BA uh, bachelor's in physics uh, from Hamilton College in 2008. He uh, did his PhD at the Joint Quantum Institute in Maryland uh, in, and finished that in uh, 2015. Subsequently, Dan joined um, the Will Oliver and Simon Gustafson and, and Equal, uh, Engineering Quantum Systems Group, excuse me, at MIT for a postdoctoral, as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and then went on to Booz Allen Hamilton and is now at the Air Force Research Laboratory in Rome, New York. So I think with that, Dan, we are ready to pull up your slides. And uh, please right, let me know when they're up. We can, great, we can see you're all good. Okay, well, uh, Zlatko, thank you so much for inviting me to this, uh, uh, to this seminar series. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, this non-adiabatic control of small gap superconducting qubits, but also um, some interesting stuff regarding you know, correlated systems and maybe performing quantum computation uh, using those correlated systems. Um, my A lot of this is encapsulated in a paper with the same title, um, and the reference is right below my name. Um, and I'd particularly like to call out Barath Kanan and uh, Yunpil Shim for their excellent contributions to this work, and uh, also Simon Gustafson and Will Oliver uh, as my advisors. Um, <clears throat> so moving along, um, this work was, uh, the idea was sort of presented and pushed by Young Pil Shim and Charlie Tahan in a Nature Communications paper from 2016. Um, and what they were interested in is uh, they noted that correlated states have different noise properties or noise sensitivities than bare transponds. Um, so think dynamical decoupling or correlated eigenbases, uh, the latter of which you might think of like a, a bell state between two qubits. Um, but you have to ask what's maintaining those correlations and whether that process is noisy. Um, so their idea was what if we only used uh, the beneficial correlated states as the computational states of our system um, and what kinds of uh, interesting uh, things fall out of that investigation. Um, so some examples of this would be a recent paper um, in heavy Fluxonian qubit where the two ground states of the, of the system are only 14 megahertz separated. And this separation is maintained by some circuit element within the, within the qubit. Similarly, you could have a, um, like a more atomic-like system where you have linear um, sensitivity of your atoms to a magnetic field. Um, and you can apply a laser to the system to dress those systems. And I'll show you my cursor. Um, and now you have two effective you know, states dressed with photons that are only separated by the laser driving amplitude. Um, so you have to hope that your laser driving amplitude is stable. Similarly, uh, spin-locked qubits uh, do exactly the same thing, but with qubits and microwave driving. Um, and this was explored by Fei Yan in the Engineering Quantum Systems Group in 2013. So common to all of these, we're going from an uncorrelated system to a correlated system. And we're trading off, in the first case, uh, flux sensitivity for that of some circuit parameter, or your magnetic field for uh, your laser driving amplitude, 
or your flux for a microwave dri driving amplitude. Um, <clears throat> so then if we zoom in on the system that I actually worked with as an experimentalist, um, we gathered pairs of transmons together and strongly coupled them. Um, and then if they're degenerate, you get uh, an avoided, essentially you get um, a separation between these two states. So you have like a symmetric superposition and anti-symmetric superposition that is maintained by the capacitive coupling between your qubits, which hopefully doesn't change very much uh, as a function of time. You can add another qubit. Um, so now we have qubits A and B, and you can even define a uh, capacitive coupling between these that allows you to perform like controlled Z gates. And this would, you know, sort of the beginning of the quantum architecture. Um, so what we did in this work was explore, um, you know, if we took this seriously, uh, what would it look like to perform, you know, universal quantum operations on this type of system and what benefits or, you know, not benefits does it have? So I've described, you know, the beginnings of a composite qubit approach. Um, there exist other ways that you could put transmons together to get interesting effects. Um, and then I want to zoom in on our experimental setup, um, uh, which requires, because you may have noticed that all of these correlated systems had states that were very closely spaced with one another, you have to find some other way of performing gates than sort of the standard Robbie type gates. Um, so we do that and then, um, the, of super interest to this this correlated idea, we also want to investigate the T1 and the, or sorry the relax energy relaxation and the correlated uh, the coherence behavior of these correlated systems, um, and then we explore the and then we figure out what the takeaways of this entire work might be. So every single transmon we decided to make flux tunable, um, and that gives us two degrees of freedom per composite qubit. Um, so I could organize those into common mode flux degrees of freedom where, you know, the states essentially just move together um, or a differential mode, uh, flux degree of freedom where the states move in opposite directions. And this latter case lets you perform gates. So if I choose a particular common mode flux and then I move my qubits past each other, my individual transmons past each other in flux differentially, um, then I can perform spectroscopy and see, you know, something that looks like this. Um, the, we have an avoided level crossing, which is established by the um, two qubit capacitive coupling between your transpons. And we will declare this to be our basis state of our system. Mm -hmm. so then, Maybe Dan, quick first question, and I'm um, not sure if this is relevant for your talk, but it seems like the frequencies, I think if I understand right, of the different qubits here are pretty low, like 3.6 gigahertz, which, which is uh, sort of a gigahertz below what you usually see. Is there a significance to that? I have a great slide um, later in the talk, which, uh, which talks about this. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that lower frequency qubits tend to have better performance. Um, uh, in terms of their energy relaxation times, at least. Um, and then on top of that, we had another composite qubit, which was actually in the four gigahertz range. Um, so that was really just to have them at different frequencies. So I'm just looking and at one composite qubits. Got it. And is there any concern with the charge dispersion getting increasingly more sensitive and, and sort of larger as you push your uh, qubits to lower frequencies? But I guess they're also hybridized here. So maybe. Maybe that offsets things to some degree. Yeah, the uh, the T two time of the individual transmons at their flux uh, insensitive points was around eighty microseconds. Mm -hmm. um, so that would imply that uh, that it hopefully wasn't much of an issue. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the EC you know, over Planck's constant for our system was 199 megahertz. Um, and I believe that still puts us in the deep in the transmon regime. Hmm. Awesome. And maybe for those of us who aren't used to uh, looking at curves like this all the time with flexitunning, 
and maybe my eye is misleading me, but it seems like the curves are a bit asymmetric. Is that due to just asymmetry in the design yeah, parameters of this is yeah, this is defined. Um, so it would look more symmetric if this common mode flux was 0 0.25, for example. Um, and then the top and the bottom would line up with each other. Um, but really, you can think of this as being one of the transmons. I'm sort of tracing it with my uh, cursor. And then the other transmon is this one. And then with the common mode flux degree of freedom, I'm uh, essentially offsetting them in flux. Um, and then I move the flux of the two qubits uh, in opposite directions in order to create this curve. I don't know if that helps. This is, this is in fact, a hard figure to sort of wrap your head around because this, is some, this isn't something that people do very often, but um, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> so what you're saying is that you're moving both fluxes on both qubits and controlling both of their frequencies uh, as you move left to right in this uh, curve. Got it. Yeah, I think that's what the top and bottom axes mean. Okay. Yep. And uh, I think it's maybe important to note, it, note that you could fix one of the, the qubit frequencies and, and just have one of the other qubit frequency tunable. Um, so that would be that would work entirely with this as well. Mm -hmm. um, there more options. Awesome. Was there any particular advantage to having both be movable as opposed to just one, which might one might hope or expect to have slightly better coherence performance on the fixed frequency um, one. Yeah, we didn't know exactly how we were going to, uh, what we we're going to do with the sample when we made it. Um, so uh, we were just giving ourselves as many options as we could. Awesome. Um. Uh, yeah, so this was, you know, we, we designed a sample, we made it, and then we wrote a paper on it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Um, OK, so uh, continuing on, um, the, you know, we started out, uh, we have our basis state, which is the, the, at the avoided level crossing. And um, if you sweep your differential flux, um, this delta f parameter, um, where epsilon corresponds to the frequency version of the flow, you know, it's like you know, cast the flux into frequency difference. Um, then you we essentially uh, move along this curve so that the eigen energies and the eigen states uh, shift to you know a different configuration, and that allows us to perform uh, single qubit gates. So a gate looks exactly like this, um, where in time you do a rapid excursion away from the gate, uh, you sweep through it, and then you return to the gate, and then this is uh, an example of a transverse gate in our system. Um, now, because the system's a little odd, um, we, I'm just going to go over the initialization and the readout of this system. Um, so we wanted to avoid using Robbie driving of any form, um, just so that we could say that we did. And so what we did is applied a microwave drive, because you have to get the system out of the overall ground state of your system somehow. Um, and then we uh, swept one of our qubits through that drive. And that uh, is, was an adiabatic landau zener process. Um, and that excites your qubit. Um, and then when we're, we turn off the drive and ramp our uh, qubit the rest of the way to its operating point. And then from here, you would perform all computations that you wanted to perform. And when you're ready to read out, you would return your state back to um, the overall excited, uh, back to sort of the bare transmont basis and perform readout. Now, interestingly, uh, you can map the drive strength and the ramp time uh, through this uh, through this drive, and you can. We essentially just need to get into this red regime um, in order to excite your qubit with high fidelity, uh, which gives you lots of options as far as drive amplitude and ramp time. Um, the penalty is that it might be a bit slow, and depending on what parameters you choose, but you only have to do it once. Um, so now, um, because our states are only 65 megahertz apart, uh, we have to figure out some new way of performing control. A conventional approach would use resonant Robbie driving, which works in our system, but um, you need to have a drive strength, which is much smaller than the, the frequency spacing. 
in order to ignore non-IDLDs such as counter-rotating terms. Um, so that means that, you know, very slow gates. Uh, so if we want to get something close to the speed limit of our system, which is defined by the, the, the separation of our states, then we need to use some sort of a strong driving approach. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that Landau Zener control is the only way, like the only applicable situation for what I'm about to describe. Um, but it happens to be that if you have a fixed gap between two states and then some sort of transverse field, then Landau Zener is in fact the system that we're working with. Um, but you could imagine also fixed frequency transmons and then a tunable coupler or some sort of driving field that performs a, a gate operation also working perfectly well with the, uh, the gates that I'm about to describe. So in the landau zener context, um, you would sweep through this avoided level crossing and uh, create a superposition of you know, an excited state and a ground state. Um, and then you'd evolve your phase away from the avoided level crossing. Then when you return, um, you interfere those states together and that allows you to perform uh, you know, state changing operations. And these types of interference effects were explored by Will Oliver back in 2005 um, in superconducting circuits. Uh, this has also been explored in many other types of systems um, in other contexts, uh, you know, throughout the decades. Um, so for our system, uh, we start out with, uh, I think what I want to point out is if I don't have Robbie driving, um, one of the nice things about Robbie driving is that you have a, a coherent carrier, which acts as a clock for you, um, for your, your gate operation. And you can perform a rotating frame transformation, which essentially, you know, gets rid of the, uh, the, the diagonal term uh, of your Hamiltonian, and then you can perform uh, essentially resonant operations uh, effectively. But in our system, there's the uh, axis of, of rotation actually changes during the gate. Um, uh, so there's no good clock for us to use except for the, the gap itself. Um, so you could imagine me defining some sort of time period where uh, the phase between my states uh, repeats itself. Um, so, you know, a two pi phase, for example, and that would just be two pi over the gap uh, over the gap. Um, and this time corresponds to about 15 nanoseconds in our system. Um, so if I want to do a pi pulse, I would simply evolve for half of that, so seven uh, nanoseconds. If I want to do a quarter, um, it would be a quarter of 15 nanoseconds. And if I want to do a negative pi over two pulse because of the modular symmetry, I can just evolve for uh, three fourths of 15 nanoseconds. Um, so our Z gates are just implemented by idling at the avoided level crossing. Um, so this is a nice feature of our system. Um, and you could imagine doing sort of any arbitrary phase Z gate uh, sort of trivially. So that means the really the only challenge is getting a transverse gate. So uh, it will turn out that you can do pretty much anything, like any gate shape works to, to some extent. Um, you just need to be diabetic enough. Um, so we chose to make a single period sinusoid. Um, and the period of that sinusoid is a mere eight nanoseconds, um, which is just sort of arbitrarily chosen. And you can assign a frequency of like 125 megahertz to this, um, you know, a frequency. Um, and then the amplitude of this needs to be large in comparison to the gap size if you're going to only have a single period. Um, and we can map this out in terms of uh, drive frequency on one axis and drive amplitude on the other. And there exist regions where you can get a pi pulse, um, several points, in fact, where you can get a pi pulse for your gate. Um, unfortunately, because it's nonlinear, uh, if I have the amplitude or do something to the frequency, there's no guarantee that I'm just going to, um, that I'm going to get a pi over two pulse. So. Uh, a pi pulse and Z gates together do not create a universal gate set for single qubits. Uh, in fact, pi over two is what I need. So why not just tune that up directly? Um, so if I just take a sort of quasi-random slice through this uh, through the system, 
um, I can just increase the amplitude until I get half a population, uh, you know, until half my population is transferred to the other state. Um, so that works for my amplitude. Thank you, Dan. And maybe a quick question. Um, I think this comes up often with, with these flux tunable nice qubits. Um, you know, eight nanoseconds seems pretty quick, especially if you compare that to something like the anhydronicity, which one might expect to be like 300 megahertz or something like that for uh, transplants typically. Uh, can you motivate for us a little bit why we would expect that to be considered adiabatic or quick or uh, or per perhaps maybe non-adiabatic? Uh, maybe just a comment on, on what adiabatic and non-adiabatic means here, or maybe you talk about that later. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is what you want is to be um, between the adiabatic and the fully diabatic regimes. Um, so that is your goal. Uh, so figure out what the boundary between adiabatic and diabatic is and then sit there. Uh, that's really what we're doing. Um, so, and then pick, you know, some random pulse shape that, that fits into that regime and you're good. Um, so eight nano, so again, 15 nanoseconds was sort of the, you know, the intrinsic uh, time span, you know, time basis of our system. So eight nanoseconds isn't that far from that. Um, and in fact, you can choose other things uh, and it will work. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, uh, that's sort of the thinking um, for choosing uh, a certain shape. Um, and then uh, as far as the anharmonicity goes, um, this is a bit of a cop-out, but because we're in the single excitation manifold of two transpons, uh, it turns out that the, uh, the anharmonicity plays a role in the second excitation manifold. So we are 3.5 gigahertz detuned from that manifold, and it really doesn't play a role. But if you are imagining uh, transitioning some of these ideas to a uh, you know a system where you're microwave you know applying microwave pulses or something like that, uh, which you can do. Um, then you would have to think about the second excited states and how they play a role. Um, and you know, you could uh, you could do the math and figure out what that will do. I see. Uh, so mm -hmm. Sorry, go on. So hopefully that that answers the question as fully as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and so this with this eight nanosecond gate, you have um, I guess sufficiently low leakage to lower states or higher states. Um, maybe at the level of sub 1% or something like that. And, and that's good for what you're doing, right? Right. Well, our detuning is, um, a, a, again, for the second excited state or the ground state is 3.5 uh, yeah. gigahertz. So right. it doesn't play. Yeah, it, it really, like, there is zero. Uh, I would expect there. I didn't even bother calculating it. That's how low I'd expect it to be. <laughs> I see. And uh, how much do you have to worry? Maybe we'll touch on this later about decay out of the CQB space. Uh, to, oh, it to happens. Work. So it's certainly something to worry about. Um, and it happens just as fast as a transmon would typically decay. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into um, some of the interesting features into this, but uh, certainly you'd have to think about it. Mm, OK. Thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> So I think one of the, the beautiful things about uh, these approaches is I'm trying to describe a heuristic tune-up scheme um, for these uh, transverse gates. So you know, if you're an experimentalist and you just want to you know, tune them up without thinking too hard, like modeling it in theory and going back and forth with some sort of optimizer, like how would you go about doing that? Um, so one of the things, so we just figured out the amplitude for our transverse gates, but we didn't figure out how there's a separate question of if I have a pi half gate and then another pi half gate, I want them to add to a pi gate. Or if I have a pi half gate and a minus pi half gate, I want them to, to destructively interfere to create, uh, to bring me back to my original state. So I do exactly that. Um, so pi half, then minus pi half. And if I concatenate a bunch of these, then I can do something like scan the duration of the gate in order to, um, and then also scan the sequence length and see where I'm always in the, in the state I started from. Um, and then once I've done that, I figured out how, you know, how to make these gates interfere in the way that I want them to interfere. 
and uh, you know I'm done. Uh, so at this point, I have universal gates. Z plus X equals universal gates. Um, now, people oftentimes want a Y gate for convenience. So uh, it turns out you can you can get that from uh, just shifting the whole X gate over by uh, T delta over four. So um, which literally corresponds to a quarter rotation on the equator of the block sphere, uh, as you might expect. Um, and now we have sort of the standard gate set, uh, you know, that anyone would work with, except they're, you know, x over two gates as opposed to uh, full x gates. Um, and then if I wanted to visualize these gates, uh, something that I did sort of for my own visual convenience is I created these boxes that that where the length of the box corresponds to the duration of it. Um, and for X gates, I colored them blue. For Y gates, I colored them green. And for Z gates, I colored them red. And you can see the Z gates are typically shorter than the X and the Y gates. Um, and the typical gate duration is 15 nanoseconds. And uh, maybe just clarify, how do you do an identity gate here? Uh, no time. Or two pi. I, uh, okay. So yeah. So if you just idle for uh, t delta, then that would be an identity gate that was not trivial. Yeah, because if you wanted to do some operation on c cube b and you wanted to idle on a, um, you would sort of make sure that you're at some flux where for that particular time that it takes the operation to do and b a has a two pi phase shift is that the idea um yeah no this this group of uh, of question givers is extremely clever um <laughs> it is, <laughs> is an interesting question and a head scratcher for us um i do have a solution but i wanted to wait until later in the talk i will i will directly address this <laughs> perfect <laughs> um, oh yeah, great question. So, <laughs> so how good does this uh, this gate set do? Um, so if we can, you know, so really what happens is you concatenate all of these gates. Uh, these gates. So for qubit A, you have the the top row, and for qubit B, you have the bottom row, and you just concatenate the gates in order to produce a single qubit gate set. Um, you'll notice that the gates are completely asynchronous, you know, desynchronized from one another. Um, so it's, uh, but as far as single qubit gates go, it doesn't particularly matter, um, so long as you don't get crosstalk between the qubits. So the in composite qubit manifold, uh, we got 99.8% Clifford fidelity and 99.7% Clifford fidelity in this data set. Um, and this was actually this is this is the worst thing that we took. <laughs> Just so you know, that's very nice. Sorry, this is for um, CQBA and CQBB. Uh, that's what the two curves correspond to. Exactly. Right. Yep. And this is single qubit uh, randomized benchmarking. Uh, this so is single qubit randomized benchmarking in the composite qubit manifold. Um, so not taking so deliberately removing the effect of. Uh, energy relaxation to the overall ground state of the system. Um, this second plot takes into account uh, just the energy relaxation to the overall ground state of the system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's literally just the relaxation rate, uh, you know, based on the duration of the sequence. Got it. And are those um, numbers uh, simultaneous? Uh, like you ran the sing Yeah, this is all simultaneous, um, which is presumably why this is the worst data set we ever took. Um, but uh, it's still pretty good. Now, to give you a sense, the Clifford fidelity, uh, you know, state of the art at the time of publishing this paper was 99.9%. Um, so we're not giving uh, where the fidelities of, you know, X half and uh, Z individually. So this is just, you know, randomized benchmarking Clifford fidelity. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out that there was a sister paper that came out uh, on the archive around the same time as ours that uh, did the same thing with uh, uh, heavy fluxonium. And they were able to, they used a totally different looking gate than us, um, but they were still able to get reasonably good fidelities. Um, so I think the secret here is 
tuning up X half and Y half gates as opposed to X and Y gates. Um, so that's how you deal with non-adiabatic gates in a two-level system. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out that this is this, this additional paper. They I think they came to the same conclusion I did, which is that this is a perfectly fine way to go. Um, so moving on to uh, the interesting energy relaxation and correlation behavior of our system. Um, there's, <laughs> it turns out that uh, going from 3.5 gigahertz uh, transmon um, separation between your transmon states to 65 megahertz, uh, 3.5 gigahertz to 65 megahertz um, spacing, um, there's two things you really care about. One is the environmental spectral noise. So it's like how much, uh, how many states are present at that frequency. And then also uh, your transmon. Uh, your transmon to other resonant fluctuator uh, matrix element. And uh, in the first case, you have sort of a, an omega squared dependence. And this was uh, a Yale paper, um, which I thought was awesome. And then a um, the transmon, transmon matrix element is also scales as, uh, as like omega. So together you get sort of an omega cube dependence. So if I was going to make a prediction, it would be that uh, you go from 3.5 gigahertz to 65 megahertz, you should expect zero energy relaxation inside that manifold. Um, and we performed interleave T1 measurements on uh, our composite qubit A, and we were not able to, dis to tell if any energy relaxation occurred within the manifold. Um, so this is... Uh, Seems applicable to the heavy fluxonium qubit as well. They were seeing, you know, uh, like 500 microsecond T1 times, I think. And I should have looked that up before doing this talk. But uh, it was it was pretty long. And if you think about other types of systems that have really long uh, energy relaxation times, they all have small gaps between their their uh, their states. So. Um, in addition, we have uh, one is sort of like a symmetric superposition of the two transponds, and zero is sort of an anti-symmetric uh, superposition. And if you think uh, maybe, you know, if there was a bath that was common to both transponds, then you would expect maybe this state to decay faster than the anti-symmetric state. Um, however, you know, I think usually our noise models for transponds assume local fluctuators are the things that the qubit decays into. So uh, there's no reasons, I think, a priori to expect that you'd have uh, some sort of correlated effect, you know, where you have like a super radiant state and a sub radiant state. Um, but this might imply that, you know, there are some shared fluctuators um, present in our system. Um, <clears throat> okay. And um, if maybe uh, oh, we and can add, I missed the question earlier, so I might throw you back. What was that? Thanks. Um, I, I missed the question earlier from Christian Anderson. Uh, I think from the gate slide. So maybe I'll get it now. Uh, get it in now if you allow us before we get too far, uh, which is about uh, T sub C. Um, I think uh, in the timings, if I understand right, uh, can you say what the role of T sub C is? Um, yeah. So if you do um, so in here, uh, you might guess that the the gate duration. Um, necessary to make these guys constructively interfere or destructively interfere as the case may be um, would be t delta but remember we're making excursion away from the avoided level crossing um, a brief one but uh, the eigen energies actually get further apart when you do that so you could expect more uh, phase evolution that you need to somehow compensate so then uh, we swept the actual duration of this pulse in order to uh, make the constructive interference occur. Um, so that's what this sweep was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so the delta mm -hmm. is literally the thing that we just swept. Mm -hmm. See, so yeah. was the thing that we swept. So it was a small change for, for this particular system. Mm -hmm. I see. And I guess those um, plus X minus X sequences are a bit like and those air amplifying sequences. Um, yeah, that's nice. Good. Yeah, I was particularly pleased that the difference between a positive X and a minus a negative X was literally just reversing the amplitude. That was nice. 
That's good. That's good. <laughs> That's very symmetric. And uh, how much do you, yeah, um, right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, if you asked a question there, I missed um, it. How much do you have to worry about? Yeah, how much do you have to worry about uh, the flat parts um, before and after the sort of bell looking curves? Uh, you, you have also before TC, uh, you have a, a bit of a padding on each side. Uh, is there some yeah, subtlety? So it doesn't it doesn't matter where the gate falls in this window but it's important that the window be this long um mm -hmm. that's because of the z argument right because you're you're doing z like a z evolution during your x gate and you need to make sure that that uh you know is a two pi phase evolution so you're only doing x i see and from the Technical control side. Um, I don't know if you remember. Maybe it's a bit subtle. The um, on those lines, do you also have some um, like uh, switches that actually gate the signal as well? Or I suppose it's an always-on interaction. You don't have any of these uh, SPST type of switches. Um, yeah. So we were. Um, let me see. We were just using uh, like a 400 megahertz bandwidth AWG to produce these signals. Um, so, uh, you know, there was really, we just needed to make a pulse that fit within that 400 megahertz bandwidth. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, uh, we didn't particularly, uh, yeah, we didn't do anything fancy. Got it. OK, thank you. That was, that was one of the arguments for doing it this way, is we're like, oh, if we don't have to use mixers and like a, an extra, you know, like fifty thousand uh, dollar microwave generator, and that might be on the cheap side uh, for every qubit. Then uh, maybe this would be a way cheaper way of performing quantum operations. Um, so, uh, okay. So we have the the small gaps. You we saw, you know, inside the manifold. You know, we could say the lower bound is two milliseconds. Um, and then we have leakage to the overall ground state of the system. Um, uh, so now um, I'm going to dive into looking at some of the, the coherence uh, properties of these systems before sort of revisiting this question of, you know, is this a problem leaking into the overall ground state of the system? Um, so one of the things that you may have noticed is, uh, you know, oftentimes transponds are sensitive to flux when they're at some sort of flux sensitive point. But as I was alluding to, um, our avoided level crossing is uh, defined by the fixed capacity train, uh, coupling between our qubits. And that doesn't change very much. Um, and if you neglect the ground states of, of the system, then I care not at all. Uh, actually, literally, the system does not care about um, anything except for that cu that coupling. Um, so that means that you have a flux sweet spot there, but you actually have, a, well, an anything sweet spot there. So any noise source that, that differentially changes the transmon frequencies is, you know, is something that you, uh, you're you insensitive to. So if I just Taylor expand this Hamiltonian, I have quadratic uh, sensitivity to any differential uh, flux. And uh, I'm completely insensitive to the common mode flux, of course. Um, now in the system, um, you know, taking from the paper, we have we had an echo time for a single transmon at this flux bias point of 3.2 microseconds uh, Gaussian dephasing rate. Um, now this is uh, this is something. This is actually not a great number. Um, MIT has since published papers where they've had much better numbers than this. Uh, but I think it's important to note that the composite qubit. Uh, um, was able to increase this number from 3.2 microseconds to an exponential 23 microsecond decay, and the Ramsey was 7 microseconds. Um, so even in the presence of relatively large amount of flux noise, um, the composite qubit, you know, happily chugged along. Um, and that's why we're able to get, you know, relatively decent um, randomized benchmarking fidelities. Uh, but I think we're also coherence limited there. So if you uh, increase these these coherence times, you could get better fidelities. Um, 
so now I think, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that that flux isn't the only thing that we're insensitive to. So let's prove that. Um, so the composite qubit, uh, you know, could have a dispersive interaction with some fluctuator, you know, it could be a two level system or, you know, say the readout resonator of one of the individual transmodes. Um, so I can make a sort of AC start shift argument for how that fluctuator would affect the composite qubit. So I'm just subtracting the AC start shifts and you get a G over Delta squared type relationship. So, you know, I don't have to move too far away from a, a two level system and notice that with my common mode control, I can do that um, to essentially make it to be able to ignore it. Um, but we can do this even more controllable way. Uh, so, you know, for example, if I apply a coherent drive to my readout resonators, there's some noise associated with the arrival time of a photon in the readout resonator. And because the qubits are dispersively coupled for readout to these uh, resonators, you have a number dependent AC start shift. So photon noise in the resonator shows up as photon noise in the qubit. And that shows up as dephasing. Um, so as a function of our, you know, the resonator photon number, the decoherence rate of our qubits one and two, um, you know, rises quite fast. So, um, but if you hybridize the two qubits, uh, that composite qubit system essentially ignores the applied um, photon number in the in these resonators. So the individual resonators, uh, well, the flip side of this is that um, the individual resonators can't distinguish between the logical states of the, of the composite qubit, um, as you might expect. But they can distinguish between whether it's, uh, there's an excitation in the first excitation manifold, the composite qubit, or in the overall ground state of the system. So hypothetically, you could perform readout on the system um, while performing gates on it. The you might say you might say Dan Dan hold on Be, before you make that claim uh, you need to make sure like you're performing gates which make these fast excursions away from the the this avoided level crossing um, so you're not actually protected while you're performing gates. Um, so we decided to test this by like looking at the randomized benchmarking gate fidelity. Uh, you'll notice I wasn't performing a uh, simultaneous readout at the time. So the gate fidelity is 99.9%. .9%. And the, uh, I applied my, you know, you know, my drive to the resonator. And you can see that up to about three photons in the resonator, uh, in the qubit resonators, um, the composite qubit uh, gate fidelity a single qubit gate fidelity essentially doesn't change. Um, and then it falls off sort of quadratically after that. Um, so I think this really indicates that you could potentially do a trivial leakage detection um, during your, uh, you know, without too much effort uh, on the system. Uh, and I thought that was a really cool feature. And it, it kind of highlights this noise insens uh, insensitivity argument. Um, moving on, you can also look at, you know, how qubit qubit crosstalk might occur. Um, so using the same AC Stark shift argument for the sensitivity of the system, um, we end up with a G over delta cube type relationship. Um, so two composite qubits shouldn't crosstalk very much um, if there's any substantial amount of detuning. Um, but you might also ask, uh, ask, okay, if that's true, then how do you perform gates at all, right? Um, so individual transmons, you usually interact like a doubly excited state of your system, and then you get in a, a hybridization or avoided level crossing with an external state of the system, uh, like the second excited state of one of your transmons. And this is exactly how it happens with the composite qubit. Um, you just need to ramp the two composite qubits together, interact them, and then ramp it back away. Um, the One of the advantages, which you may have noticed from the animation, is that both composite qubits are kept fully hybridized while sweeping the, you know, while you're sweeping the common mode detuning between them. Um, so they're at the single qubit flux sweet spot over the entire sweep. Um, now, that does not mean that you're completely insensitive to flux. So 
for example, the common mode uh, flux of the composite qubits is something that you're still sensitive to through the sweep. Um, so maybe only half of the noise would potentially be gone. Um, and then we can also look at how the um, control Z or the ZZ interactions would fall off as a function of detuning between these qubits. And you see that um, we begin to follow this black curve uh, as it diverges from the, where the transmons would uh, go. So you can see that we, we believe at least, uh, and we followed this as far as we could, that the composite qubits would um, have a very suppressed uh, crosstalk, um, even for you know as little as 100 or 200 megahertz detuning between them. Um, <clears throat> and then this gets at the earlier question uh, from many slides ago um, that one of the, the viewers put in. And that is, OK, if your qubits, you know, can you even perform two qubit gates on this system? Um, so uh, qubit A and qubit B are desynchronizing. Um, so if you need to have a gate which is, you know, requires synchronization between the two qubits, how do you deal with that? Now, thankfully, a Z gate is commutes with the controlled Z gate. So essentially, you just perform the controlled Z gate, and then you compensate for any um, uh, Z shifts that occurred in your system. Um, so, and then you just continue on from there. So uh, it turns, and this is a, a burning question of ours is, okay, is it even possible to perform two qubit gates that are consistent with uh, these, this new approach for single qubit gates? And we're able to pull out um, the two qubit gate, the controlled Z fidelity using interleaf uh, randomized benchmarking. Um, unfortunately, uh, the two qubit gate fidelity was limited by slow gate speeds because, you know, when we designed the system, we didn't put in a large enough coupling between the composite qubits. Um, and on top of that, uh, the flux noise also plays a role with the common mode uh, detuning between the systems. Um, that being said, there's really no difference mechanistically between this system and uh, a simple transmon system. So if it works, if you can do a good controlled, high fidelity controlled Z gates with regular transmons, you can do it with these, trans, uh, with these composite qubits. There's nothing stopping you. Um, so <clears throat> I, I think that, um, you know, if, if someone wanted to run with this type of architecture, uh, you know, it does have the possibility to be a higher fidelity uh, type architecture. Um, so then uh, going into the takeaways, um, we explored a composite qubit uh, type architecture. Um, and we were able to explore computational paradigms that uh, you can't do if you're using every state in all the transmons in your system. Um, so I think it, it really highlights, you know, we saw some nonlinearities in the, the uh, coherence behavior, uh, especially. Um, so, you know, maybe by adding transmons that aren't explicitly part of the computational uh, states of your system, you can really win in some ways. An example of this might be the MIT coupler, um, uh, tunable coupler, which, you know, you never expect to excite that qubit, but by adding that extra qubit in, you are able to perform uh, a tunable operation between two other qubits. Um, it's also possible to exchange one source of noise for another, uh, which ideally is less noisy. So for example, uh, we, you know, we could trade off the noise on our qubit frequencies for qubit-qubit capacitive coupling. Um, and then if you were working with a spin locking scheme, you could also uh, you know, trade off your qubit frequency noise for a microwave drive amplitude. Um, and then because our states were so close together, we were forced to develop, um, you know, to develop some strong, you know, gates in the strong driving regime. Um, and they can still produce high fidelity gates uh, with relatively low uh, calibration overhead. So we showed like a heuristic approach for developing, um, for just tuning them up experimentally. Um, and it's pretty simple. Um, you just need to aim for the, the pi over two gates as opposed to the pi gates. Um, interestingly, <clears throat> uh, let me see. 
And then these gates are, which was not obvious ahead of time, these gates are compatible with uh, you know, controlled Z gates, for example. Um, so I think that's that's important for saying, okay, you know, maybe you could develop this these types of strong driving schemes for uh, you know larger computational systems. And again, you know, if you wanted to do uh, uh, this type of strong driving regime, um, you can actually, you know, it, it works with parametric coupling potentially. It works with tunable couplers, um, but you would just need to think about the system, you know, in a different orientation. Um, so I think that uh, the, this has a potential for reducing the calibration overhead for, you know, coupling qubits together, for example. Um, or you could try and implement this in the way that we did. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge the ever-expanding uh, engineering quantum systems group at MIT and the Lincoln Laboratory uh, folk as well. Um, so uh, with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for the great talk and very interesting results. Um, Christian has uh, has a question here. Uh, you mentioned that within the manifold, um, you had a lifetime of more than two milliseconds. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to the 100 nanosecond being a slow gate in quote marks, uh, quotation marks, it would seem like 200 nanoseconds is fast compared to within the manifold lifetime. Yeah, we, um, so I think our perspective, and I'll just zoom back to this T1 picture. Uh, maybe it's more efficient as doing this. Okay. Um, so from our perspective, uh, the thought, and you know, maybe you could explore this in a, a, a less noisy sample. Um, and again, just for Will's benefit, uh, MIT has, you know, has demonstrated some of the best flux coherence times you know, anywhere in the world, um, but that was not the sample. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to, to say, uh, is you know we were envisioning that if you have um, like a, a T1, like if you had extremely good T2 times inside the composite qubit manifold, that potentially you could win if you were able to, uh, you know, in an error correction sense, if you could measure the leakage in a high fidelity way. And the nice thing about the and the nice thing about our leakage is that it's incoherent and it only goes to one state. Um, so essentially, you know, if by performing readout or whatnot, you detect that your system has leaked, then maybe if you had another qubit side by side with it, uh, then you'd be able to copy the state back over to this, this qubit in real time and then keep performing operations. Um, so maybe this would be more amenable to error correction. Um, so that would be only if your, your coherence times inside that manifold were really long, right? So then you essentially you'd be saying, okay, I can, you know, I'd have an effective, extremely long coherence time. And the only thing I need to worry about is this, uh, bit flip error, um, or, or like error that they takes you out of the computational manifold, uh, which you can fix or detect and then hopefully fix easily. Um, so. That being said, we still need to perform our operations uh, much faster than you know any sort of error time scale. So I think it's important that uh, you know the gates be fast in comparison to whatever the worst error time scale is. Um, so that would be the 27 microseconds and the 41 microseconds. So you want to be able to do stuff during this time scale, and then if there's an error, you know, handle it sort of in real time. Um, that would be sort of how I'm, I'm thinking about it, but, uh, you know, that would definitely be a, a work for the future. But hopefully that answered that question well. Yeah, thank you. And folks, feel free to follow up with that question or other questions in the chat box here on the left or right hand side. Um, right. And can you tell us, we mentioned a bit about, you know, for this, you could control the qubits with essentially all you know, DC lines, so to speak. Um, is that fully, fully possible or do you still need, uh, if you, let's say you, you built a new setup and you wanted no, uh, mic mixers, microwave control on, on those qubits, 
you know, to find them in spectroscopy and do all the setup and uh, all the initialization and all of that stuff, you know, bring up, uh, I think is the word I'm looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Is that sort of how this was done and how this could be done or? Um... Yeah, um, we had, we had a diagram in the paper, which is unfortunately I didn't copy it over to the talk um, that kind of lists the, the infrastructure that you need. Um, so you still might require a mixer or two for performing the, the readout. Um, and then, you know, a microwave drive tone, obviously. Uh, and then yeah. also, yeah. you I, also need a microwave sorry. drive tone for, um, initializing the qubits. So if you imagine like uh, a set of composite qubits being at sort of a low frequency, like 3.5 gigahertz and another set, which is what we had um, at, you know, 4.2 gigahertz, um, then you could imagine these guys being <coughs> uh, that you would need like uh, two microwave tones or, or something like that in order to excite one set and excite the other set. So you just turn on the microwave drive you sweep through that microwave drive and using baseband pulsing and you can just prepare everything. Um, so that would require what, three different frequencies. Um, we actually played around with, because the two composite qubits were close enough, we played around with actually just having a single microwave drive and then uh, using sideband control in order to create two effective microwave tones. Um, in the composite qubit manifolds and then exciting them that way. So we had like a single dry frequency uh, extra carrier. And mm -hmm. you can kind of step through and, and figure out like, okay, does this cost a lot less or cost a lot, you know, uh, compared to regular transmon architectures. And you find that probably, um, but it's, you know, I, I feel like someone would actually have to try to scale it to find out. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, in the paper, there's there's a table that that goes through sort of the resources that you need um, uh, and compares the sort of the traditional versus this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you might need um, RF on the qubit lines to initialize it, um, and I guess the readout is still a readout resonator, so that's at RF, but you know maybe that's a separate resource and on its own without the qubits. Yeah, thank, I mean it's it's a fixed uh, overhead, right, for every ten qubits or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So then, the I guess the question is, it, you sort of save on on the you know multiples of qubit side of things potentially. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, very nice. And um, can you talk a little bit about stability of these devices? You know with Flux stability and so forth in terms of their T1s, T2s, you know, over weeks, days, and and uh, and maybe the stability of the gate tune-ups. Um, you know, is this something you can leave for a few hours, have some coffee, come back, and it's still pretty good, or or does it drift a lot? Yeah. So um, we. Uh, well, the news is good. Um, <clears throat> We, I tuned this up in October and I ran it through December and I didn't have to touch the tuning. The tuning of the flex curves. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't need to change any parameters um, between October and December. And what about the, the gate tune ups and gate amplitudes and stuff? I imagine that you'd have to retune at least daily. No, it's the same. It, it didn't change. Really? Well, that's. I, I don't know any other system that does that. Um, uh, huh. um, unfortunately, I, I, I sort of carved a weird path through my, my time at MIT. So while I did do some single qubit, uh, like nice single qubit operations, I, I never worked with sort of a scaled regular architecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, that was not an experience that I, I really knew to, to I, I sort of assume that the microwave tune-up would be consistent. Got it. Yeah. Maybe it's a few percent on fidelity. Um, in this plot you show here, there, there seem to be a bunch of um, little streaks of red and blue. Uh, are mm -hmm. those, um, can you comment on those? Especially in the middle, there's there's a, around yeah, zero, zero flux. We were, 
uh, yeah, we didn't actually route any charge lines to these qubits. Um, so all of this spectroscopy was done through the readout resonators. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose I can make a, you actually have um, sort of a gap in here in the spectroscopy and it's sort of off center. Um, and that gap might correspond to like no Purcell decay in this, in this particular region. It's hard to say, um, but I mean, it shows up here. So it's not like the composite qubit is actually protected from that. Um, and then there's a series of, there's a line that sort of follows my cursor right here mm. that goes mm. this way. And that might be excitations with a you know, second excited state. Because remember, I was microwave driving it. Um, but this is not stuff that the actual composite qubit under normal operation would actually see. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, like the flux driving doesn't mix you from uh, the ground state to 3.5 gigahertz or vice versa. Mm. Or to the second excited manifold. Right. And can you remind us uh, the frequency span uh, for sorry, your pi over for across all the gates? You do the single qubit gates and two qubit gates. Uh, you know what's the frequency span that you're kind of sweeping over? Uh, for the control Z, um, just the, I guess across the, the palette <laughs> uh, array of different gates uh, that you have to do. Um, yeah, I mean, so let me see. The X and the Y gates are essentially the same, right? So the um, so they swept. Um, I have a perfect plot for this near the beginning. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just do this. Um, so. <laughs> This plot right here is true to life um, in terms of the amplitude. So the single qubit amplitudes are, you know, literally going out this far. That's how far they go away from the avoided bubble crossing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, I see. For, yeah, for two qubit gates, um, we would sweep the common mode. Uh, so this avoided level crossing as a whole would go up about a hundred and some odd megahertz. Mm -hmm. And the other um, the other qubit, there was actually a two-level two system um, that was near the top of its range. So we deliberately moved it to the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so it barely moved during the controlled Z gate. So yeah, essentially we're sweeping by 150, 200 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Great. OK. Yeah, that's fairly narrow range. Because um, I guess my follow-up to that was, what about two-level systems in that range, which you've touched on? <laughs> And what were those stable? Did they, you know, what happens if the two level system jumps right in the middle of, of that range? Uh, or did you see that? You know, do you have to? Do you, um, do you, yeah, it, the two level system didn't really move around much as far as I was able to tell. Um, and when I moved the qubits uh, away from it, it uh, they really stopped seeing it. Um, hmm. so, uh, but if you do look at my T1 data, um, you'll notice that the uh, the qubit B, the one that's higher in frequency, actually has somewhat worse uh, relaxation to the overall ground state of the system. Um, mm. And uh, its coherence is also slightly worse. Mm. Got it. Um, uh, it was kind of nice, like the, the single qubit gate, like if you operate single transmons in that regime, it was, it was just awful. <laughs> And maybe this is a more standard question about just flux uh, control line design, but um, you know, what what did you have to do in your design process or worry about um, in terms of T1, T2 leakage through the flux control lines, uh, since they have to be pretty fast here, um, you know, Purcell effects and things like that through that line. Are there any special you know structures on that or? Yeah, we we put a 300 megahertz. You ever load up one of those procedurally generated on? games? And so, um, oh, it's too far. Uh, yeah. So uh, these flux lines had 300 uh, megahertz uh, mini yeah. filters, um, reasonably close by, not too not too close. 
Um, and then that sort of did for preventing uh, relaxation into this line. And relaxation can occur at the qubit frequency when you have uh, asymmetric junction transmons, or sorry, asymmetric junction squids, which these uh, transmons had. Um, if you have symmetric junction squids, then uh, that wouldn't happen as much, and you could potentially forego the filter. Um, but really what we wanted to do is make sure that you can get direct uh, decay of this qubit into the control line. Um, and uh, was that mini circuits, was that, are you saying that was uh, cold or that was that room? It was uh, cold, yeah. Um, but, you know, a fair, like, I don't know, a foot away from the sample. Mm. Okay, cool. Great. I think, um, unless there are any final questions from the audience, um, I see we're about 10 minutes over. And um, I think with that, Dan, you can probably take this time to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you for accepting the invitation, for giving this great talk, and for the nice results. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, the pleasure was ours. As always, this was uh, really fun and interesting and exciting. So, folks, if you miss any parts of this, you know, feel free to reach out or especially go back on the talk, the talk will stay live. Um, and otherwise we will be back next Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time with the Kiska Quantum Live seminar series. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone.